Okay, so welcome everybody to the second half of the Logic Combinatorics Day. Uh, hopefully, uh, next time it happens, it may actually, people may actually be together physically and then we can uh, chat a bit more afterwards and interact. But uh, Adam was supposed to be here in person, but uh, anyway, we're lucky to have him uh, by video. So, Anand Pillai is going to talk about approximate subgroups with bounded VC dimension. Thanks, Anand. Okay, can I start? Thank you. Thank you to Alex and Udi for uh, setting this up. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was supposed to be visiting Paris, actually, for a month, visiting Zoe Chattadarkis in Paris and coming for a few days to London, to England. And so, uh, anyway, sorry, uh, so we unfortunately didn't, we, we're not doing it. So. I'm talking about this approximate subgroups VC dimension. I'm doing it. I hope this works. Uh, it's joint. I've got about 15 slides like this, but it's a bit, maybe a bit dense. So I will uh, just discuss what's going on, what it's about, and then maybe some, if I've got time, some ideas at the end about proof, strat proof, proofs, and then maybe comments. But let's just see how. I guess I've got an hour, Alex. Right? I've got like it's an hour. You said, yeah. Okay, yeah. this, this, is what is, this is joint work with Gabriel Conant, and a preprint was put up, I think, about a month ago, if I'm not mistaken, sometime middle of April. And uh, so, what is going on? We, we're studying the family of all pairs, GA, where G is an arbitrary group, and A is a finite subset of G, okay, all pairs, assuming Number one, so G need not be, G could be non-abelian. Small tripling, right? A times, a, this is the collection of products, something in A times something in A times something in A. The size of this, which is finite, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a less than or equal to K times the size of A for some fixed K, okay, number one. And number two, this is I'll call later, I'll call it, I'll call it a NIP assumption. But anyway, you, Look at given the group G and A, you find you get a bipartite graph G, the two vertex sets are the same, doesn't matter, V, G, and E, where the edge relation X, Y holds just if X times Y is in A, right? So from this pair, you get a graph, a bipartite graph, and the assumption is that there's a fixed, bi a fixed finite bipartite graph gamma such that you look such that for every pair I'm considering, this bipartite graph emits gamma as an induced subgraph. Okay, so there are two basic assumptions here small tripling and this uh, control, the associated bipartite graph emits a given fixed uh, finite graph. Good. And the conclusion is roughly speaking, and I'll, I'll try to make things precise later, up to a small error, A is a union of a bounded number of translates of a coset nil progression of bounded rank and step. And bounded means uh, bounded in terms of the number K and the graph gamma, okay? Over all pairs GA satisfying my assumptions. And I'll give the terms, I'll explain these terms subsequently. Now, I'm not going to talk about explicit bounds. I, I know this is a combinatorics seminar, and in combinatorics, people of a combinatorics persuasion are interested in bounds a lot of the time, but I'm not, I'm sorry if that's not true, but this is, I mean, this is, uh, seems to be an important thing. But here, the whole methods are not, are, are, in some sense, are, are qualitative results. Bounds exist in principle. And the question of explicit bounds is interesting, but I'm not going to deal with explicit bounds in this talk. It's like, a, it's, okay, it's a qualitative description. It's a description of such sets A under certain assumptions. So it's all pairs GA satisfying the assumptions, okay? Now the proof will make use of non-standard methods. This is the model, this is the model theory content, is the methods of the proof are non-standard. And I'll say later on what I mean by non-standard. And related to a certain paper by, my, by Conan, Gabriel, Conan, myself, Pillay, and Gabriel uh, and Caroline Terry, we call it two, it's called structure regularity for subsets of groups with finite pieces of dimension. It's about arithmetic regularity rather than this approximate business. 
It also uses existing results on approximate subgroups from Briar, Green, and Tau, which themselves were, were developed out of Udi's work. And, and Udi's work on approximate subgroups was also an inspiration. The whole, the whole technique of, of, doing, of doing a non-standard, uh, going to a non-standard model and, and, and performing a model theoretic analysis, right? This is kind of Udi. So it's inspired by Udi's uh, work. Okay. Now I want to give some background. Can you see this? It's supposed to be background one, right? So is the audience really mixed? I mean, people of all possible whatever, all possible persuasions. I would like to start with some background, which motivates or explains what and why, what is going on and why. So I'll start with what I call the arithmetic regularity problem, or sometimes one some people, some, some mathematical mathematicians call talk about a regime, you know, a certain regime, but I don't like the word regime so much. So the arithmetic regularity problem of trying to say something meaningful about all pairs, G A, where G is now a finite group and A is a subset of G. And this is something in analogy with semi-radio semi reg graph regularity, which is about all finite graphs, say bipartite. And, we, and in fact, Given a finite group G and a subset A of G, you see from this previous thing here, there's an associated finite graph, bipartite graph, so there's already a direct connection with some graph regularity kind of uh, business, right? So that's arithmetic regularity, try and say something, mean, mean for all pairs in analogy with separated graph regularity. And now A shouldn't be too small. Otherwise, you can't say very much. So you could look at all pairs GA where A is three points, for example. And that's it. That's all you can say, right? The conclusion is A has three points. That's all you can say, right? So the conclusion is the same as the assumption. A has three points. So it's tautological in a, a very strong sense. A, but, so, so, but, but you, you would hope for some results when the cardinality of A is big enough. So, for example, you're looking at, you fix some delta between zero and one, and you want to say that the size of A is a, is a greater or equal to the delta of the size times the size of G, then you may hope for some kind of structure. An extreme situation is where you'd like, where A is close to being a bounded index subgroup. The subgroup's a bounded index, just depending on delta, for example. You know, this would be a, a nice conclusion. It's not true, but it would be a nice conclusion. And in some situations, it's almost true. Uh, so this is the this is the uh, arithmetic regularity problem. Now another problem is you look at all pairs. We look at what I'm talking about G A, where G is not necessarily finite group, and A is an arbitrary finite subset. So G is not necessarily finite, but A is a finite subset. And again, in this situation, when G is infinite, again, you can't say in general. It's it's hard to say too much, right? Because A is going to be small. Whatever if if G is infinite, A is definitely small. So I don't think you can say too much. So it's natural to put on additional hypothesis on A. And uh, one such hypothesis is small tripling. So the idea is A should not be so far, should look a little bit like a kind of subgroup in some, in some fashion. And the small tripling assumption is that, again, A times A times A, the size of this, so the collection of this, this is, a, this is the collection of, something in A times something in A times something in A, finite set, the size is at, is, at, is, at, is at most K times the size of A for some fixed K. And so we put this assumption on and we'll call this the approximate subgroup problem or regime, if you want to use the word regime. Okay. Uh, now Freeman's theorem says that when A is a subset of Z, or Z, or Z, I don't know, how, or Z, Oxford Seminar, Z, with small doubling. So the small doubling, this is what you, I just look at A plus times A, which is, in, it, so in the commutative case, small doubling is enough to do everything. Small tripling is because of the non-commutative deal. So when A is a subset of Z with small doubling, then A is contained in a generalized arithmetic progression of size at most C times A, where C is dependent on this K where k is the doubling constant, okay? So Freeman's theorem is a solution 
to the, to the specialization of the approximate subgroup problem when g is the integers. So you can, you can specialize this problem to certain g or certain a and you get another and you get a specialization of the problem. So Freeman's theorem is a solution to this uh, a special a, to the specialized specialization. Let's go back to arithmetic, regu so arithmetic regularity is when, uh, remember G and both G and A are finite and you're going to be assuming something about A, I guess, not being too small. So green has a certain Fourier analytic statement when G is abelian. And that's a paper he wrote on something like a, a, a Semiredi type, a Semiredi type theorem for abelian groups. Is that right? Anyway, it's from 2006 or seven. So there's a statement when, in fact, I do not understand that this, this statement because of some, I'm challenged in various ways, particularly I can't really understand that statement he makes. But the general case of G non-abelian is open and we would, and we would like, we would actually like have a project to try and deal with that non-abelian case using sort of non-standard methods that we would have been doing. However, there have been a series of results on the arithmetic regularity problem when you put additional conditions on the, on the, actually, yeah, the, it's now a finite graph, right? G, G, E, A. Remember, E, A, I said X, Y, so this is two vertex sets, G and G, which happen to be the same, but we treat them as distinct vertex sets, and E, A is the edge relation, says that X times Y is an A. So you put additional conditions on that graph G, on that five bar diagram graph. Additional conditions are things like we call K stability or K NIP. This is a VC, a VC, a Vatnik, Vatnik, Chervenenkis dimension condition, K stability. I'm not gonna talk about it, but I will discuss. And this K NIP essentially means, is like a more or less omitting a given finite induced graph as a subgraph, right? As induced subgraph. And so the these started with Terry and Wolf, who dealt with uh, the K stability case and FP to the N, Alan Fox Zhao, Sisask, and Conan Pillay, Pillay Terry one and two, two papers we wrote, one on the stable case, one on the NIP case. And uh, in fact, I talked about the second paper in about roughly, I don't know when it was, it was in, it was in probably around eight March, two years ago, March, 2018, in Oxford, in Oxford. Uh, okay. And uh, as I said, the K and IP case is more or less the case of some fixed finite graph gamma being emitted by this associated bipartite graph, which I'll discuss later. Now, among these references, if I'm not mistaken, only the paper by, only the work by Gabriel, Conan, myself and Caroline Terry deal with a non, not necessarily abelian case of G, right? I think if someone can correct me, but I think that's, I think the, early, the, the other papers, uh, Terry Wolf was specific to FP to the end. The first paper, Alan Fox Zhao, was commutative, commutative. Uh, yeah, so I think we dealt with non commutative case. And Al, yeah, Udi. Yeah. Uh, if you can go back a slide, I'm missing what is open. I mean, I understand that under additional conditions, you give a better structure theorem. No, I'm talking, I'm talking about, I'm talking about a general theorem. I'm talking about a general theorem for all G and A, G finite, okay, yeah. when G is not abelian. Why, why isn't the, the, the Bruyard Green Tau theorem a solution to that? Uh, no, the Bruyard Green Tau, the tau theorem in the case when in the case when G is finite, you call what you I'm not sure I'd call it I'm not sure it's a solution. No. They do not assume that what do you mean? That you you want to assume G is finite or A is finite? G in the case here, G and A are finite. Um, 
I thought that they did it for the case that A is finite, whatever G is. Yeah, but it's not, okay, it's not the kind of result one is, one is, uh, okay, we can talk about it later. It's not the kind yeah. of result one would, one, one is, one is thinking about. It's, it's I understand a, that under more conditions. One would like a, one, one would, the idea is a kind of regularity statement, you know, a regularity statement of some kind. So, uh, yeah, I uh, don't know. So that's why I'm asking, could you yeah, say, okay, anyway, okay. So it, it, so this, this is with a take it with a pinch of salt, but I think it's not what, what is done in Brio Green Tau is not what one's looking for here. There is some structure theorem for A, but it's not exactly. I mean, one's looking for some regularity statement of some kind, as in graph regular, some, some analog of graph regularity. And uh, for example, in the green statement, in the case when the group is FP, when the group is, in the case when the group is FP, to some power, so F2 to some power N. So two is fixed, N is, two is of course fixed number, N is moving. In that case, his result specializes, you see, so, so you get this, right? You get from G and A, you get this graph, this bipartite graph, G, G, E, A, okay? To which, to which semi regularity applies, but you'd like it to apply in a way which is compatible with a group structure. So in that case, you get actually semi-ready regularity applies, which I didn't state regular summary, but it applies where the partitions of the G and the G are into cosets of a fixed subgroup. Okay. And this is the kind of regularity statement one's interested in. Now, of course, one doesn't get that in general, but this is the kind of statement one is so it's one is interested in. So it's not the same as. It is not exactly the same as what is done by it. Okay. And there's an epsilon there. There'll be an epsilon involved. That's in some radio regularity. There'll be an error. Okay. The green tower is there's no error in, in green in, in the Brio green tower. So what we're looking for is something a little bit different. Okay. Mm -hmm. But thanks for the question. It's a, it's a good uh, because this issue is connected with everything we're doing. Because we well, in fact, okay. Anyway, we talked about uh, some results. We put additional conditions and look at the case where you impose this KNIP condition, which means, I say here, it's more or less that a fixed graph gamma is emitted by all the GGA. And then we dealt, and our conclusion of the work with, with, uh, with Gabriel Conant and Caroline Terry was that up to a small error in various senses that one has to be precise about, the set A is a bounded union of translates of some set pi to the minus one b where pi is a homomorphism from some bounded index sub when i say bounded i mean bounded in terms of the data you know the k or some, whatever it is right the k over all pairs ga satisfying the assumptions where pi is a homomorphism from a bounded index subgroup h of g to a torus a torus is a, a possibly End of k dimension, n dimensional torus, real torus, and b is a nice, open, symmetric neighbor of the identity. You know, some little thing, a ball of radius r, and again, the, the r and the dimension of the torus are bounded, are controlled by a controlled by a, by your k in the background. Right? This is this was the this is what we did. So so you get a very strong uh, regularity statement. Uh, in some sense, uh, and about your translates, right? So it's a, it's a strong structure theorem for, uh, okay, in the, now going back to approximate subgroups, again, we have the theorem of Brio Green Tau building on what Udi did. Approximate subgroup regime, again, is where you have an arbitrary group G and you have A as a finite subset with K tripling. And the conclusion is that A is covered by a bounded number of translates of a coset nil progression P, which is contained in A and A to the minus one to the power eight, the collection of eightfold products of that set, right? So this is, there's no almost or something like that. There's simply a straight, a straightforward state where B has bounded rank step and bounded so-called normal form in terms of, in terms of, uh, 
in terms of the approximate, right? In terms of the K, so approximate subgroup is, so here A was had K tripling. A had K tripling, right? So in terms of A, the boundedness is in terms of the number K, okay? This is, right, now our aim was to combine the approximate subgroup problem, all right, and the K and IP arithmetic regularity problem by considering pairs GA, G is now an arbitrary group, and A is a finite subset with K tripling, so arbitrary group K tripling, this is the approximate subgroup regime, and then we assume now the DNIP condition for some fixed D, right? That the graph, the graph, the same the graph G, G, E, A omits some uh, given, fi given, fi given finite, uh, finite graph as an induced subgraph, right? This is, this is the aim, to combine, a, to, combine a, to combine the approximate subgroup issue with an arithmetic regularity problem to get maybe a better structure theorem for uh, for this A. Okay. So this extends and was motivated by some recent work of Amador Martin, but maybe Amador's in the audience. Is Amador in the audience? I don't know. I, I heard Amador. I am, I am. Hello, Amador. Hi, Hello. Amador. Hi. I heard him in, in, in Tamar's talk and Daniel Pallison and Julia Wolf, in fact, who assumed the stronger condition of destability, which I will not talk about. Uh, and they, in fact, they gave a talk, Daniel Pallison gave a nice talk in Oberwolfach meeting in January. And from that, we began talking to Gabriel about uh, doing what we're talking about. Now, also Olaf, Olaf Sisask has a certain preprint, I don't know if it's been published about on these issues, in, the word convolution is in the title, and he has a statement, and he doesn't use the word DNIP, he says VC dimension, so, you know, I'll, I'll say more about the NIP assumption, it's kind of a, it's a VC condition on translates of A. In a special case when G is F sub Q to the N, Q fixed, N moving, okay, Q fixed, N moving. So it's a finite group, but, it, but it, you know, even this whole approximate subgroup is it also makes sense when G is finite. It also makes sense and it's non-trivial because A is arbitrary, satisfying the, the, the tripling assumption. And the statement of Sisas, just he has a statement there, a, true, a statement without a proof, but he just mentions a, the freeman russia uh, context, although his paper is about arithmetic regularity. Now the title of this talk mentions approximate subgroups. So, uh, so a K approximate subgroup of an arbitrary, so a K approximate, K is a number, positive integer, a K approximate subgroup of a group G is a symmetric subset, a symmetric means A equals A to the minus one, such that A times A, the collection of products of something in A and something else, is covered by K translates of a covered by right so there are k left say left translates of a whose union contains this set as a subset okay now a finite k approximate subgroup has k tripling it's immediate moreover if a is finite with k tripling then this set a unit a to the minus one squared is f of k approximate subgroup for explicit f c x c times x to the d c and d constants. Uh, right. So f is a function here. F is a function. F is c where c and d are absolute constants. This is by tau. This makes the connection between k tripling and uh, and approximate. And for abelian g. K doubling it is enough for everything. So somehow K tripling, you need K tripling for non-abelian. So abelian case, the, the doubling as in Freeman's theorem. So, okay, at this point, in, at this moment in time, are there any questions? Uh, ah, oh, I forgot to do pause here, sorry. I forgot to do pause there. Any questions at this point? Udi, did it? Did what I say clarify things a bit or not? Um, 
a bit, but I'm still not clear what is the open problem. And I, because you said, I think my problem comes from the fact that you said you're not interested in bounds. And it's not clear to me what question you might ask in the general setting without mentioning something about bounds. But maybe, I mean, maybe at the end you can explain what is the open problem for the general. No, I can't. I'm not going to explain the open. To explain the open problem is to give a conjecture. I don't want to give a conjecture. You know, I don't want to get. No, I, okay, it's something I don't want to. I'm not, I'm not saying I don't want to talk about it, but I want to say that it's not. I, I'm not sure I want to uh, be. Uh, you, okay, what you can do is you can look at Green's paper, right? Now, I don't understand that paper. I don't even, I don't know what the words mean. You can look at the paper, you can look at the theorem, and you can say, is there an analog of this for non commutative G? In his That's, theorem, I don't know this theorem, but is it, isn't it, I mean, does it make sense qualitatively, or is the whole point the bounds there? But no, the, no, it's not about, it's, it's not only that there are bounds, it's not only about the bounds, it's a Fourier analytic statement. And the Fourier analytic statement is typically in an, in an abelian environment. Okay. You know, but that's a formal thing. You look at the, I mean, for example. I'll try to look, fine, yeah. yeah. For example, his, uh, you know, as I said, his statement in the case of, so in the case of, uh, yeah. So for example, in the case, when the group G is F2 to the N, or even it works FP to the N, the conclusion is actually a Semiredi is a sem is a Semiredi theorem for the associated bipartite graph, but where the partitions are compatible with the group operation. Sure. Okay, so one wants some kind of statement of this. And you could ask, is there a similar statement for arbitrary finite groups of bounded of bounded exponents? And in fact, we do have a statement of it. We do have some kind of statement like this, you know. So, yeah, that's. Well, yeah. we can we we but we can talk about it some other some other time. So uh, let me see. Now I have here actually a slide here which should be with pauses, but I didn't I didn't do the pauses. So, sorry. So I want to talk about. I'm going to introduce the notion of coset nil progression. So we define some terms for motivation. I start with. So this is for. I mean, people in combinatorics know this stuff very well, I'm sure, but as the audience includes some logicians, some model theory people, this is partly for the model theory people. Okay? It's also, you make it, you state a theorem, then, you, then, then, then the minimum is you know what the words mean, right? Minimum, I mean, how to do the proof is something more different, but the minimum, you should know, that's why I'm stating what the words mean, because otherwise it doesn't, okay, never mind, sorry. Okay, so, a generalized arithmetic progression in a group G. And what, what I'm taking here is a little bit, I'm not sure this is totally correct, but I'm taking it from a paper from a survey paper of, Bri of Briard, Emmanuel Briard. A generalized arithmetic progression in a group G is the image of a d-dimensional box product minus Li Li in Z to the D under homomorphism from Z to the D to G. This is the okay. Now Li L, this Li is typically integer, but it could actually be a real number. And you're looking at the things it makes sense anyway for real numbers okay so it's an image of a box in z to the d under a homomorphism here g is you in this context g is usually abelian and there's a an associated properness condition which i'm going to simply not state but it's there in the background says that pi is one one injection for g abelian now for g abelian such a generalized arithmetic progression of dimension d, d is the dimension is this d here, is a two to the d approximate subgroup. It's a basic fact. Okay, so this is an example. This is a canonical example of an approximate subgroup, a generalized arithmetic progression inside an abelian group. On the other hand, a converse was proved by Green Ruscha generalizing Freeman's theorem that if you take a finite subset of an abelian group G, which has k doubling. In particular, if it if it's k approximately as k doubling, then a is contained in E translates of a coset progression. Now, what's a coset progression? Coset progression is something p of the form p zero plus h, where p zero is a generalized arithmetic progression of dimension d, say h a finite subgroup, and p is contained in two a minus two a, and E d depend on k, right? E and E translates in the d dimension depend on k and of course the size of p itself is controlled by and therefore what li are 
are controlled by the size of A. This is a green rusher theorem generalizing Freeman. So here's a generalization of coset progression to a non-abelian environment or to a Nilpotent environment. And I'll just be very brief. This, this again comes from Briar's, one of Briar's very nice, Briar wrote many survey papers about approximate subgroups, very informative. This particular survey paper actually, I forget what it's called. It makes the connection with uh, uh, something called super strong approximation. So, so it's, it's nice because it, it, it states what is the origin of all this approximate subgroup uh, uh, problem and super strong approximation is a kind of strong, is, is, is an important uh, part of the motivational background. In place of the box B, one considers that the box B was this box up here. In place of this box here, you take a box in the free null potent group of step R and rank K. So rank is the number of generators and step R is a null potent, nil potency step, nil potency rank. It's those elements which can be written as a word in generators E1 to EK, where EI and its inverse appear at most LI times. Okay, for each I. Okay, that's it. That's the. And a nil progression is an image of such a box under homomorphism. And a coset nil progression in a group G is a set P of the form P0 times H. So G is no longer abelian, where P0 is a nil progression, and H is a finite subgroup of G, which is normalized by P0. And we say that P has rank R and step K if P0 has rank R and step K. And again, there's an, there's an underlying analog of the properness condition or irredundancy condition called C normal form, depending on a constant C. And I do not want to get into it at the moment, but, in the, but this, it, this is described in detail in the Briar Green Tau paper and in the paper we wrote with Gabriel, which is uh, called approximate subgroups with bounded VC dimensions. It's the same title as my talk, you can find it on archive. So, so there's, there's, a, there's a properness condition also, which, which is, uh, I won't talk about, okay? Which is there in the background. So it's, it's, it's an analog of a, of a generalized arithmetic progression in a, a, non, a non commutative environment. Uh, Finally, I want to say something before stating the, the, before making a statement of the theorem clear, I want to mention the NIP uh, situation. All right, so making it just making it precise. So given a pair GA, G an arbitrary group, and A an arbitrary subset, I will say that A is DNIP, depends on the ambient group G, if this associated graph G, G, E sub A omits the graph, what is this graph? This D is simply the numbers one to D, right? It's one, two, it's the set, one, two, three, four, up to D. This is the collection of subsets of that set, power set, membership relation, right? It's a specific graph, right? It's, it's, not, not a complete graph, of course, but right, it's not, but it's, there's lots of edges around, right? So you can think of every subset of D as being coded in this, in this thing by, it's, right, it appear, every subset of, appears here, right, in the second. So that's DNIP emitting a specific graph. Now, this condition is implied by the condition of being DNIP is actually implied by emitting some sufficiently large finite subgraph where you can bound how, how large it should be. And A being also, so, so this implies actually that in some sense, emitting this graph is a kind of universal condition of emitting some finite graph, something like that, you know. So these are fundamental graphs in terms of emitting something. And being, a being DNIP is equivalent to the family of left translates of A and G. It's a family of subsets of G 
left translative A, having VC dimension strictly less than D. So these, this is about VC dimension of the family of translates is about the associated bipartite graph emitting some specific graph, okay? Uh, and by the way, we'll mention something we mentioned in the paper, which is a slight improvement of what tau of the connection between tripling and approximate subgroups is that if A is finite, and in your arbitrary group, if A is finite and D and IP with K tripling, then actually already the smallest possible set you can get containing A to have a chance, even this is the, this is the symmetric, the symmetrization of A. You take A, you take the inverses and you add one. You make A into a symmetric set in the most easiest possible way is already an approximate subgroup C C sub D. This means C sub D is a constant depending on D. K to the E, K is my K tripling, E absolute constant. Okay, this is what we mentioned. So, so even the NIP thing gives you a better control over passing from K tripling to approximate, from tripling, to, from small tripling to approximate. Right, now I want to try to give uh, statements of, precise statements of the theorem, okay? So let's recall again the, the uh, briard green tau theorem. If A is a finite subset of an arbitrary group G and A is K tripling, then there is a coset nil progression P contained in A unit A to the minus one to the power eight with rank and step O sub K one. And O sub K one, it means rank and step is a constant, is bounded by a constant depending on K. And also in the background, there is uh, a statement about the C normal form. I mentioned that as a properness condition where the C also is of a form A, K, o, A, o sub K1 and such that O sub K1 translates of P cover A, right? So A is bound, covered by a number of translates of P depending only on K, right? So P, this is the BGT theorem and there's no epsilon involved, right? There's no, it's not a regularity type statement on the face of it. It's not, a, it's not a regularity theorem, whatever regularity means, okay? It's something else, it's a structure, some kind of structure theorem saying that A is close to, is commensurable, A is some, somehow, A is commensurable with, you know, that's it, it's, it's commensurability statement. It's that A is commensurable with a coset nil progression, right? With bound, with some bounds on the data involved. So maybe that's the best way of saying, it's a, yeah, so it's the best way of saying that maybe is that is these approximate subgroup theorems are commensurability theorems. The regularity theorems are something else. That's the, there's a difference. The regularity is not a commensurability statement. Okay. Uh, good, that's the BGT theorem. Now, let me state the theorem that we prove. I'm sorry, it's a bit long, but that's, that's it. I'm sorry, it's a little bit long here. This is our theorem. Suppose A is a finite subgroup of a group G and A has K tripling and D and IP. So the, the, okay, I, I'll just read through it and then in the next slide I'll, make, I'll say what, what this is about. Given epsilon bigger than zero, there's a coset nil progression P contained in G and a subset Z contained in, this is the AP means uh, the translates of A by elements of P, the unit, the unit of the translates by elements, in fact, P will be finite also, of course, this will be finite. This is the error set. The size of Z is less than epsilon the size of A. Okay. Such that P is control, P is contained actually in A times A to the minus one intersection A to the minus one A. So P is very close to A. Moreover, a is contained in CP for some C in A. Uh, and yeah, and C, later on I'll say that C is small. 
So A and P are commensurable. C actually will be said to be a small size bounded by something or other. So A and P, but this, so P is close to A in certain ways, commensurable. This one actually is simply is simply part of in some part of 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 Brouillard green tail. Here's the crop. The, the crucial thing is that is that after throwing away Z, A is A is more or less a finite union of translates of P. Okay, that's what it says. The size of the symmetric difference, symmetric difference, take away Z is less than epsilon times the size of P. And number two, which I think is a consequence of one, of number three, a consequence of two, says that for every G, for every translate of P by an element outside the error set, I, it says that, uh, this says that, that, uh, GP is almost con this is the complement of GP is contained in A almost, or GP is contained in A almost. So each translate of P intersects A in A uh, is either almost is either contained in A or disjoint from A up to epsilon in a sense, right? Moreover, the rank and step of normal form of P and the cardinality of C are bounded by constants depending on the data D, K, and epsilon. If G is abelian, you can take B to be a, a, a coset progression, proper, means with this properness condition. Okay, this is the statement, and it takes some time to pass, but let me say what is the kind of content. I'll go back. So first, there's, notice in BGT, there's no epsilon. There's no epsilon, right? So there's item one in, includes BGT. Item one here, there's no epsilon mentioned. So it simply includes BGT, but there's an improvement. And the improvement actually is that P is contained in this rather smaller set than A, U and A to the minus one to the power eight. There's a slight improvement, but of course we have more assumptions, the DNIP assumption. So that one is basically Bourgain green tau. A and P are commensurable. A is commensurable with a with a with a coset null progression. The, re, the rest say that up to the error set Z, A is actually a union of a bounded number of translates of the coset null progression P. And this is a right, A is up to the error set Z. There's an error set Z. There's also another error set. So uh, this is approximately. This union is actually approximate. A is up to the error set Z, after throwing away Z, A is a union with some small errors, and the errors controlled by epsilon times the size of P, of a finite and bounded number of translates of the cosinal progression. So this is a tight structure theorem for A. Okay, it says that a, 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 a K tripling set A is actually a union, essentially, up to some error in the sense I said, a union of a small number of translates of a coset nil progression. So it's a strong, I would say, a tight structure theorem for A. And this actually is the combination with the regularity statement. So, but the regularity statement, so regularity normally, regularity somehow is that, is that you, you know, regularity of a of a of a graph is that if, is that is that is that subgraphs have the same approximate uh, uh, density, right? That's regularity of a in the sense of graph. Now, having the same density, regularity can be improved to homogeneity, which means that a graph is almost complete or almost empty, right? That's a stronger form of density, and here. This is the kind of homogeneity. As, this is the homogeneity conclusion in place. So this is this is a so this is a regularity statement here in the strong form of homogeneity in place of regularity. Note that three here follows from two. Three as a consequence of two, but it's a, but it's a, stated in a nice form, right? It says that uh, every translate of, of P meets A everywhere or nowhere. 
up to a small error, depending on epsilon and p, size of p. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, when g has exponent at most r, or even this set a, even the set here, has exponent at most r, which means r is just a finite number and everything is to the power r is one, then in fact, this cosignal progression can be replaced by a finite subgroup. Okay, by a subgroup h. By a, so, in fact, right? so the conclusion being that after throwing away the error set, a is a bounded union of left cosets of h. Again, a stronger structure. So in the case when you have bounded exponents, together with this NIP assumption, the, the k-tripping set is, a un, is, 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 a, is essentially a union of cosets of a subgroup with some bounds going on. So you get even a stronger, even a stronger, which is a very, a very strong regularity, a strong regularity statement, okay? Which is strong in the sense of homogeneity in place of regularity. Now, the rest of the talk, I want to, there's not much time left. I've got another few slides. I don't know how far I'll get. I want to discuss some aspects of the proof of this theorem. And it's more than just, I say, superimposing. It's more than just, uh, it's more than a simply, when you've got the CPT2 and you've got BGT, it's more than saying that plus that equals this. It's not, it's not, it's more than that. But there's a similar strategy. So it doesn't follow directly. I mean, CP2, T2 is, a, is in the arithmetic regularity environment and one couldn't just directly superimpose. Although in some cases, actually, there are some cases such as abelian, in, in fact, in the bounded exponent case, I, I forget what, or abelian bounded exponents, you can actually, Gabriel, in the paper, one can actually get a direct consequence of these two things. You can, you can in, in some case, you can reduce to actually a finite sum. You can, you can replace G by a finite group. Then you can apply CPT2. But in general, you can't. But the strategy is similar. Well, the, I say, I say a strategy, right? I've got the, I can't say that word. Strategy. Okay, it's different, similar. Now, the proof is basically a non standard proof. Now, what, what's non standard mean? You mean, and this is what. Udi was doing in his approximate subgroups paper, you prove a single statement in a non-standard environment. Non-standard means you have a group G now equipped with a pseudo-finite subset A, which has K triple with respect to the so-called pseudo-finite counting measure. And A is DNIP. So maybe I'll say a brief, a few brief words what I mean. If you want, when you think of this non-standard environment, I, it's nice to think of this pair G and A. It's one, one way of thinking about it, if you know a little bit logic, is to think of G and A as living in a non-standard model of set theory. And that model of set theory thinks that A is finite. That's what it means. Okay, so A has a, A is an internal set in this non-standard model of set theory, and it has a cardinality, and the cardinality is a finite set in the sense of this model of set theory. That's another way of thinking about it. Or, Another way of thinking about it is that G and A is an ultra product of a family of groups G I A I with a of G with a subset A I where uh, G I is an arbitrary group and A sub I is finite. Right? There's also an ultra product way of doing it, but I'm not a, I'm not like an ultra product person, really. You know, so anyway. The use of model theory or logic has two aspects. Number one is proving the relevant single statement in this non-standard pseudo finite, And that single statement will just be something of the form, given this data, there is a finite, there is a finite, something or other, actually finite, and with some properties without any bounds. And then you, okay, then you, that's the statement. And then pulling this down, suitably pulling it down is pulling it down to the actual standard environment where actually where g is an arbitrary group and a is a finite subset pulling it down suitably to obtain the theorem the pulling down is the transfer between uh non-standard between ultra product and the 
this is the logic, right? So now part B, this is pulling down a stable from upstairs to downstairs. Upstairs is like non-standard environment. It's like a non-standard model of step theory. Downstairs is standard model of step theory, where finite is actually finite. This is really, at this point, is routine. It's logic, but it's routine. And it's, it's really, a, it, it's like, I don't know what to say. It's just, I mean, there are some delicate things involved, uh, possibly, but it's, it is simply a subroutine, a routine subroutine, which simply you can plug into whenever you feel like it. And it's, uh, it's, the, it's elementary non-standard analysis, okay? So part A is the main thing. And that main thing here is proving the relevant statement of the non-standard model, which is, and that's a model theoretic argument. But our current proof still involves a little bit of going down here and there and appealing to BGT. So it's not a, in some sense, it's not a it's not a totally kosher model theory argument. <laughs> if, you, if you don't mind me saying, you know, saying mentioning the word kosher at this point. And so it, we which means we appeal to ultra BGT. We appear to BGT and ultra product, right? Which is more or less going down. Anyway, from this point on. Which is not a lot of time. It's like ten minutes, nine minutes, but I'm not. I'm not sure how much I can say. From here on, it's what I'm saying is model theory, okay? And I'll be using model theory language totally freely, but it's only nine minutes, right? So I think nobody will be really permanently damaged by seeing this. Nobody. I, I Alex. I hope this is not going to permanently affect anybody's anybody's some anybody's inner spirit by seeing ten minutes of model theory. Or nine minutes. Anyway, the rest of it you can you, you can stop listening or something. If you feel like it. I don't mind. But I want to say something about. All right. So we have. So we're now in this environment, non-standard environment. So G and A. One may want to think about this as an ultra product of G sub I A I, where the A I is a finite, with K tripling and D and I P. We can assume G is satur saturation as a kind of model theory condition saying that what could happen does happen <laughs> more or less right uh and actually the k tripling assumption of the ais goes through to the a because it's first order statement all right well you, you've got to be careful uh, there's a counting measure there's a okay dnip goes through because it's something you can express first order k tripling depends on a certain size but I mentioned I mentioned later on the kind of so let's you take this G you look at the look at the subgroup H of G this is what Udi, Udi did generated by A H is what we call a V definable subgroup a V definable group is, a, is an object defined as a dis, as a possibly infinite union of definable sets the definable sets are these the A to the M union A to the minus M union one All right I think, where for n group bigger than two, this is covered by finite. Yeah, and and the condition about the k tripling tells you actually that a plus minus one m is covered by finitely many left translates of a using our assumptions. We have a pseudo finite counting measure, normalized such that it makes size of a equals one. So you have the, this comes actually free from thinking about A as finite in the sense of the model. Anyway, it doesn't matter. This is, this is, this is, I'm not, this is, this is a certain, this is a counting measure. As soon as I, this is a measure where certain defined, certain subsets of G get a, a measure, which is a real number, not a actual real, not a non-standard real number, a real number, and such the measure of A is one. So this is the analog of the counting measure that we have to measure cardinalities, okay? You look at the ring generated by the left-right translates of A by elements of H of this group it generates, right? And the ring means, it's not a Boolean algebra, but you can take uh, complements inside a given member of the ring. So it's a ring, it's a slight generalization or, 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 of Boolean algebra, okay? It's, uh, it's, in fact, I think it's something in, it's, it's a well-known expression in, in measure theory. Then this measure, this normalized measure is, turns out to be less than infinity valued on elements of R, 
and is both left and right H invariant. Okay. Now, let me see the basic steps. Let me see what I want to say here. I just go through the steps. I just go, I just say the steps for the, for the model theorists. Uh, so, right. Step one is the NIP stabilizer theorem. Now, in, 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 in Udi's work on approximate subgroups, his main theorem is the stabilizer theorem. That stabilizer theorem is sometimes later called the Lee model theorem, I think. Is it, am I right by, by, but in fact, it's the, the stabilizer. And Udi's stabilizer theorem has a slightly uh, improved version under the NIP assumption. Okay, you produce a certain countably R type definable normal subgroup of H, gamma. And gamma lives in A, A minus one, it lives in this set. And gamma is exactly H zero zero R in model theoretic notation. So gamma is a certain, you, you predict the stabilizer, as I write there, is a certain type defined, means defined by a conjunction of formulas or definable sets, which are all in the, in the ring R. The quotient is a locally compact group with a so-called logic topology. And we have a canonical subject, I call it funny G, we call it the canonical subjective homomorphism. Then the next step, which you, everything here uses the NIP assumption. It says that this mu measure, the counting measure mu is the unique up to, up, up to, up, up to some normalization or scaling is the unique uh, invariant measure on R. In fact, we just proved that, that any other such measure has the same zero ideal, but this is enough. Step three is a so-called generic local comp locally compact domination. This is this is the this this is a development of what we did with in CPT CPT two to the v-definable setting. I don't want to say much about it. Anyway, uh, it's now actually it's now almost time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna so step three is generic local domination. Step four, let me say quickly. Uh, this gamma is a section of these definable sets Wn decreasing. For every epsilon, there's a, a small set in R, small measure, such that for all G outside Z, either the measure of the translate Wn in a section by G in section A is zero, or so this is this is a statement looking very much looking very close to the regularity statement in the in the theorem. And this is used to this is used together with uh, with BGT to, to to prove the following. In, and this is the statement, the single statement in the non-standard model, which is the end final statement for every epsilon bigger than zero. There's an internal coset nil progression p in normal form. This is living upstairs, and a z subset of a times p with z in R my ring measure of z is small p is contained in this a in this set here a is covered by phi, a and p are commensurable and every g for every g outside the error set either the translate gp intersects a in a small set or the measure zero set or uh, is or a is contained or gp is contained in a up to measure zero. The conclusion is that A take away Z is a finite union of translates of P up to measure zero. This is the statement in the non-standard model. And this pulls down by routine methods to give the theorem. Okay, it's exactly, it's exactly, well, it's like a minute to go, but I'm going to stop there. I should write, oh, actually there is another, there's a final, there's a final, that, that's a final remark, which I can, I, I may, I may say something in response to questions. This is about, about, uh, okay, there's a final comment there that I may, I may say if there's relevant questions. So I've, I've, I'm, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, e end, I, end of talk. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks very much, Anna. So I'm going to follow Alex in, uh, postponing the, the applause.
uh, uh, yeah, and just uh, go straight to questions. Do people have questions or comments? I can't see most people. Um, yeah, um, so maybe uh, um, the first question while people are thinking, maybe you want to show that uh, additional comment that you're going to make? Oh, thank, thank you, thank you. So additional comment was a natural question. Uh, so, so Gabriel Gabe, my co-author, talked about this topic recently in a Berkeley logic seminar and I think it was last month and uh, sometime last month and anyway a natural question one may be asked by Pierre Simon I think he asked the question is whether there is a pure measure theoretic model theory statement in the background which means there is simply a straight model theory statement about something goes on with and under the assumption of a certain the definable group with a certain measure attached and a certain, you know, is there a statement from which everything follows, right? W what we've done is in, so without mentioning finite or pseudo-finite, without mentioning anything finite, just a straight measure theory, measure theory, model theory statement in the background, which implies by transfer the result. And uh, the answer should be yes. Uh, for example, uh, what you need to be is for the model theory people, there is an account. So, so again, you know, the, the situation here is one is dealing with a what we call local version of NIP. I have a single formula, in this case, X belong, you know, A, X is in A times Y. And that formula is an NIP formula. So it's a local version. In model theory, we often assume stability or NIP for a whole first order theory. This is, this is what we're doing here is local version. And local versions themselves have a little bit of trouble. It's, it's problematic. But there's an, there is an account of generically stable phi measures for phi x, y, and NIP formula uh, uh, by, well, we can do it by, I think Kyle Gannon did it in his thesis, for example. And uh, the notion of K tripling generalizes to the presence of an invariant measure. So this is, this is somehow, you know, I think one can do part of it. That's part of one can do it, I believe. Okay, by making some general model theory assumptions, which are satisfied by the pseudo finite pseudo NIP environment. That could, but also there's this, nil, there's this nil progression. So I didn't mention this. Where do nil progressions come in? The key point is that we have this locally compact group H mod gamma. Now, H, now H mod gamma is actually, I say, it's an inverse limit of Lie groups. In fact, it has, this is a locally, whatever, whatever the, the uh, theorem is actually, it has an open subgroup, which is an inverse limit of Lie groups, right? Not actually itself, but anyway, let's say it's H mod limit of Lie groups. And the point is that in the situation, where everything comes from the pseudo from, from the finite, you know, where this everything comes from this finite environment. Uh, the point about this is that it's inverse limit of Lie groups, but the Lie groups have the property that their connected components are nilpotent. And this is where this is an actual statement in in Royal Green Tell, and that is where the nil progressions come into the picture. Okay, so in the case when G is abelian, it would be coset progressions. It would be, right, so, so what one would assume that uh, something like this, one would assume this condition. And then I think, uh, then, then, right, and then you would, uh, then I think in that situation with this assumption, you get the same theorem upstairs, I would think. But maybe there's a bit of work to do. But the, but, but the current proof, involves going back and forth, involves appealing to Briar Green Tau, okay, and going to ultra, ultra B BGT. That was it. That was the final comments. Right. Um, yeah, one question that I can't remember in very precise terms, but roughly speaking, 
uh, yeah, so they reprove, I mean, they give a different proof of a stronger version of the Gleason Yamabe theory. Um, and in that, you, by what you explained, you get a locally compact group, but let's say um, if it's connected, this theory tells you that it's a finite dimensional Lie group by a compact group. And I think uh, the, the Lie group you can control and you can bound the dimension and so on, but the compact group is difficult and I think they did not quite get it effectively either. Uh, does your proof, when there's an additional NIP assumption, does it give you more control over the compact parts there? I don't know. I've got no idea. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question of how much this NIP assumption. Yeah, that's a nice question of how much the NIP assumption. I mean, I don't know if one can. I'm not sure one can control. Can I don't know? Can one maybe control better the uh, the nil progression? I don't know. If if is that somehow what you're asking in a sense indirectly? Yeah. Well, it's you could. Yeah. That would be a consequence, maybe. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. We didn't. We didn't. Uh, we, we were happy to get the result <laughs> without. Yeah, but I don't oh. know. It's a good. Hmm? There was another question. Uh, yeah. So may I ask a question in relationship in relation to this? So let's say that um, we we just have a Lie group that is definable in uh, let's say R, right? Uh, in uh, in the real closed field R. And in, the real field, say, in, the, in the real field, or look, you mean the real or real clothes? What do you mean? Real field. Uh, the real field R. The real yeah. field R. And then let's say that um, we take, uh, and let's say that this, this Lie group has a uh, quite high dimension. Yeah. And suppose uh, one take a definable subset uh, in the real field. And you look at the Haar measure. And if you know that with respect to the Haar measure, uh, one half small tripling. Um, does your result potentially implies that um, that set can be covered by a finitely many set B? What kind of sets? What sets? Um, the original set A. So let A, the A over here could be definable in the real field. You call it X. So you have a, you have a, a Lie group in the reals. You have yes. a subset A of G, definable subset, right. and you have K tripling. Yeah, in terms of the Haar measure. Yeah, at the Haar measure, and you're yeah. asking for, so, so G is a, a, a locally compact group, so what, A has got, say, positive measure or something? Yeah, A got positive measure, yes. So For the Haar, okay, okay, for the Haar, for some Haar measure, which is in, typically infinity on G, and you, Okay, and then what, what, what conclusion do you want? Um, so is, is the similar conclusion that you have possible? So there, there could be a group homomorphism into the torus uh, such that the pullback of, uh, uh, so A can be covered by finite limit translate of ball set. But, no, but the, the, the Haar measure isn't, is, that's not gonna be necessarily generically stable now, right? Right. And yeah, so we so definitely, so, the, the generic stability is real crucial, I'm not sure. Yeah. You'd have to you'd have to do some work to replace that. Yes, he's he's right. I mean, it, but but this is but this is a case. Okay, you could ask for G. You could ask say G a compact group. Yeah, then you right. could ask for A inside G. So take G compact A inside G. Mm -hmm. uh, forget K tripling. Just A inside G compact. A has NIP in some sense, and then right. yeah, and I don't know. Yeah, you could. Yeah, if you put like an FSG group there, then it would then it would be better. Pardon? If it was an FSG group instead of the reals, it would be better. FSG group. Yeah. Uh, well, no, G is like, say G is a compact group. Yeah. yeah so let's say compact group. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're thinking FSG in a, in a saturated model, is that what you want? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't know. I, 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 yeah, I, I guess you could say some things. What, what exactly, I don't know. But I mean, uh, yes. Okay, so, so here, you, here, you, here you already have your, you already, no, I mean, the, you see the key thing, the key thing, okay, this is more or less generalizing the arithmetic regularity in the NIP context, right? And there, the key point 
is that whatever locally compact, the compact group you get by this quotienting operation is, is, is pro-finite by abelian. And that's where the tori come in. Uh -huh. In general, it's not going to happen. That's the key thing about the tori. The reason tori come in, in the case of CP of, of Conant Pilateri 2, is that, mm -hmm. uh, is that you're in a, is that this, this is that your, your, your group comes from a, from a pro finite, from a, a finite environment or something, pseudo finite environment. And it's, and you have the property that the locally compact group, the compact group is, is pro finite by abelian. Okay. Uh -huh. so I think Tori is not going to, even with assumptions on A, I, I don't think Tori comes into the picture there. I don't think I you can get mm -hmm. Tori. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay. More questions? Actually, maybe, maybe I can ask one. So um, you said you weren't going to talk about bounds. Yeah. Um, but in, in, your, in your theorem, what, what, what should one expect as a dependence on epsilon? Should it be sort of something reasonably nice or, or, or some sort of tower function? Or some what? Some sort of tower function, something very yeah, fast. I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't. So my co-author, Gabriel, who's here in the audience, maybe he has been thinking about, but, you know, in related, in, in, in a general problematic of dealing with this, you know, with this regularity statement or this kind of statements, especially in a stable situation, the issue is to get good bounds. And he, he actually has been trying to get good bounds. So maybe Gabriel could step in here and say something about bounds. I think that the, I mean, the, the guess is that in terms of epsilon, it should be, it shouldn't be tower type like in regularity, but so it should be much better, but perhaps there still will be some number of exponentials you need, but they'll depend on the K and the D, the sort of like constant data rather than the epsilon. Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Any more questions? So maybe ask one, one quick question. You had a very striking statement that if you have um, a symmetric approx a symmetric subset, which is uh, which has uh, k tripling, then it's already an approximate subgroup, right? Yeah, that's it. Yes. Yeah. Does that's that? Uh, can you say something quick about the proof? Is it a consequence of the whole theory, or can you see it more quickly? Uh, to be honest, I'm going to defer to Gabriel to Gabe here. Gabriel, can you say something? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. So this is a this is a preliminary step that we need that we use in the proof, and it and it really it really is is kind of like a in this regime or whatever you want to say. It's a it's an analog of like the epsilon net theorem that tells you if you have an NIP set in a finite group of positive measure, then it's actually already generic, but only depending on the the NIP and the and the measure. So it's really it's really like it's it's that kind of thing that we can cover. We can cover um, a union a inverse by some bounded number of translates of a using using epsilon nets from the VC theorem. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. So so Gabriel here has been is this this is actually a joint talk with me and Gabriel. <laughs> Not only a joint, but it's a joint talk too. Any anybody else? Um, so Andrew, may I ask uh, just may, maybe a more general question. So yeah. um, is there a ability for just a locally compact group in terms of power measure? Is there an analog, a good analog of BGT for locally compact group in terms of power measure? Yeah, so uh, but of course, this doesn't make much sense because uh, let's say if you are looking at the Lee group, right? The condition of uh, tripling over there is in some way bounded by the dimension, so it doesn't make too much sense. But perhaps one need to ask something like, uh, you need to allow the dimension of the group really large compared to the tripling yeah. constant. Okay, so this this is this is Min, who's who's our postdoc in Notre Dame, Min, and he's interested actually in doing these combinatorial type the these some of these theorems. Where in place of finite group you look at you look at Lie groups or compact locally compact groups. So, you know, in fact, we, we, we're going to talk about these things together in Notre Dame. But maybe Udi or somebody else can can comment on uh, his question about doing some of these theorems where in place of finite data you have you're already, you're already inside a Lie group. And there are theorems of people about situations like this. 
Could, could, maybe I, I can't remark, but maybe somebody else can remark on this. I, I can say one thing that I think that Tao had a grad student who wrote a thesis on some BGT in a, continu in a more continuous environment. Yeah. Um, but I haven't looked, I mean, it's, the, the thesis is online somewhere, but. Um, does, um, Min, does Min know yeah. that, you know this Min? Yeah, yeah I'm aware of this thesis, but, uh, okay, so I, I think that there's some problem with thesis actually. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm just kind of like wonder in general if someone can say something. Okay. I don't know, I don't know, we can, we, 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 we'll talk about it, right, tomorrow or something. <laughs> yes.